So this beautiful landscape you can see on the Swedish west coast if you sit uh, on uh, Ram, Ram uh, around the Fjell on Koster and look out towards Jursholmen and uh, towards the west and that's actually uh, some around uh, New Year's Eve so this is winter time so Swedish west coast is beautiful also in winter time if you ever intend to visit it. And uh, I got very, uh, so to say, very engaged in marine issues already when I was like five years old. I'm originally from Switzerland and uh, then studied environmental sciences and started working with spatial planning. But I was always wanted to work with the sea and work with the coast. So after uh, when I got the possibility to start to think about participation conflict management, I realized that my natural science master's degree at ETH Zurich doesn't really help me to understand participation and conflict management. So I needed to get paid for reading books. So what do you do then? That's when you do a PhD. So that I found a possibility to do a PhD at Gothenburg University and uh, take four case studies, uh, two in Kungelf, which is uh, where Ida is working as well, and two in uh, Strömstad, and one of them was uh, the Coastal Sea National Park. And my question was, how can you, through spatial planning and uh, participation, is this actually a way to solve coastal resource conflicts in a, in a deeper way? Yes or no? And I got very much into integrated coastal zone management. So a wave again to Ramonas. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it's actually one chapter in my thesis is very much about integrated coastal management. And I just realized, oh, my God, uh, we have been planning in Switzerland along the lake shores. And uh, there is a possibility in Sweden for municipalities to plan out to 22 kilometers, uh, 12 nautical miles into the sea. And they're still not doing it really very much. Why aren't they doing this? Uh, and uh, eventually also, why aren't they doing this actually uh, in the economic zone? So I have followed the Swedish uh, MSP development from the 1990s uh, in person on the Swedish West Coast and from uh, earlier on also when I was doing background research for my, for my thesis. So MSP, ICZM and uh, conservation and participation are my, my topics of, of research. And as you can see on the bottom line, there's a lot of financiers who have financed this research. And Costa Sea National Park, well, at that time when I was doing my PhD, what, uh, uh, it came out that actually, well, if you look at the problem solving and if you look at how much actually was discuss discussed in what is happening in the sea and how can we actually realize what is happening in the sea and include this in planning, uh, the process in the coastal area went actually farthest in including also users in the sea in the municipal planning, which otherwise was just representing national interests. Uh, but there was a local plan for the coastal area and that I found to be very interesting. So I wanted to follow this process. Uh, and that was 2006 when I presented my thesis. And since then I have followed it. And now I'm going to take you uh, further on a sailing trip to coastal area. And this is like a summer night and not winter. So to have the opposite of the, of the, of the seasons. And this is where we are going first. Uh, Koster and Utrevaler, which is on the Norwegian side of the coastal trench. And uh, what is interesting is that this is a shared, so to say, marine trench, a fjord, this is called, where you have uh, cold water coming in from the Atlantic uh, and or the North Sea and, and uh, a little bit less cold water and more fresh water uh, coming out from the Baltic Sea area. And uh, together with the geology and uh, the landscape characteristics, uh, this actually makes a lot for a lot of biodiversity that has been interesting to protect for uh, a long while and where also a research, a marine research station has been established. So that's one of my, uh, so to say, areas where I'm very much uh, uh, at home. And that's uh, not the least through the Swedish Institute for the Marine Environment. Uh, but I'm also situated in Stockholm and actually sitting now in Stockholm on Hebsholmen. And that's when I, where I'm working for Nordregio, uh, not the least with international collaboration on marine spatial planning, such as the EMSP project that is now just starting up, collaborating between North Sea and Baltic Sea area. And uh, here, 
I'm just going a little, little, little bit, tiny little bit towards the end. I will try to mention a bit what is happening in other areas where we have national park processes on the way or national park processes that have, uh, so to say, stopped, but where we instead have uh, an arrangement where we have uh, marine protected area networks within the HELCOM uh, 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 so to say, a marine protected area network co collaboration, and in the uh, while the Costa Utrevala are part of the OSPAR marine protected area network collaborations. And here, what you can say is that uh, how the public was approached, how the locals were approached in these different areas, and how they were included in the planning process for these national parks and how much the national authorities also were interested in investing into a participatory process, I'm coming back to Ramonas again, uh, has very much affected uh, the outcomes and how much also the locals were interested in collaboration and need, needed and saw possibilities through the national park was also an important factor for, for the outcomes. So what is the context? Uh, here we have a changing context in terms of uh, two global key challenges, biodiversity loss and climate change, uh, where we have to think about in terms of the sea, how do we protect and enhance biodiversity and the ecosystem functions that we are depending on. We need to think about uh, in terms of species and how they migrate and how they live, but also in terms of ourselves, uh, about flexibility, resilience, and how to capture, for instance, carbon uh, both naturally through natural processes and technically, we need to think about restoration. Uh, in terms of paradigms, what is important in conservation, we have seen a shift from uh, species during the 1900s to places and ecosystems and genes with the biodiversity perspective. And from, so to say, single no-go zones in specific places to, okay, actually, ecosystems are connected. And if we want to protect uh, a species, we need to actually look at the, how it is connected to the rest of the ecosystem and of the habitat, and even more so in marine areas. And also the idea that you don't need to have like one type of protection, but you can have different types of protection and that you need buffer areas and you need somehow to uh, vary depending on the actual needs of protection. And here, uh, I think Australia and the protection of the Barrier Reef has been some kind of a forerunner, but this kind of thinking has also come to the European context and the Baltic Sea and North Sea context. Uh, and then of course, thinking not just landscape and nature, but also thinking nature and culture and uh, thinking sustainable development. And in that sense, also involving the users, uh, the local population, the um, owners of the land and their shift has occurred all, both in planning ideals but also in uh, conservation ideals from rational top-down scientific towards more inclusive interactive deliberation collaboration and using different types of knowledge i will come back to that and in that sense also stakeholder involvement or user involvement or those of those who are affected has so, has evolved and uh, one thing that I really want to emphasize, and I will again come back to that because it's so important, is the why. Why do we want to have stakeholder involvement? Because that defines the who, when, where, and how. And this is one of my, so to say, uh, research <laughs> favorite topics, per, probably I could say. And uh, in terms of uh, purposes or why there's, for instance, knowledge that you can share, you can learn, you can enhance legitimacy, you can get actually practical contributions, and you can work with deeper con conflict management. And that's what I would like to elaborate a little bit more. So uh, what is the context right now? We have the United Nations Convention on Biodiversity. We have uh, the, the recent initiative of the UK. Uh, 30 by 30, 30% 30 marine protected areas by 2030, but what does this mean? The European Di Union Biodiversity Strategy, Habitat Birds Directives, and then we have all the Baltic strategies, not the least HELCOM, but how is this going to work and where do we put our MPOs and uh, who puts and who decides and who has a stake? So there's many stakeholders in the sea, as you can see, and that's just pictures I have taken myself and um, probably some borrowed from my, from my partner or, or one of my ex-partners. And uh, how can we make this involvement actually work? 
Uh, and here I'm citing, uh, a, a, so to say, a booklet from the Baltsy Plan Project that was actually a, a predecessor uh, of Ramona's project, one can say maybe. And uh, uh, where like, uh, yeah, the Balts and the, the, the Vikings and so on, they, should they beat each other uh, because they cannot uh, agree upon something? Or wouldn't it be better that uh, we sit around the fire and discuss and have soup together? and uh, actually discuss very clearly how to, what we want and why. So even marine, uh, not just marine spatial planning, which this booklet is about, but also a uh, marine protected area design is about a management plan and the process. And it's about uh, how to balance these tricky areas of sustainable development in a specific place with a specific setting and specific people at a specific point in time. And there will always be conflicts and values that you somehow need to find uh, how to agree upon and how, what to prioritize. And then of course, if we look across borders, then the systems are also different. We have expert driven systems, we have uh, where politicians decide or we have more public and bottom-up processes, and this can vary quite a lot. It also varies some, sometimes between regions how they want to work. So when we think about the process, and here I'm, so to say, citing from a handbook that we have used for marine spatial planning, but I think it applies also to MPA planning, that in principle participation, if you want to have it meaningful and if you really want to have the problem-solving part uh, and the, the depth of the knowledge uh, enhanced, then you need to think about three levels. On one hand, it's the actual management process with the documents and decisions and the different phases that are, of course, overlapping. On the other hand, it's the data and information processing and knowledge that produces the planning and the management evidence. And on the other, on the third, it's the participation process with citizens, stakeholders, and so on. And of course, this needs to go around the loop but maybe with differing intensity for different stakeholders and also for different reasons. So why do we involve stakeholders? On one hand, we have the authorities. Uh, they have instrumental reasons. They want to have information, better plans. They want to exchange on something. They want to get gain acceptance and legitimacy. legitimacy. There are normative reasons because the legislation says that uh, for democratic reasons, you should involve uh, the citizens. And then, of course, there can be transformative reasons that you want to change things, that you want to uh, support people to participate, that you want to support the learning process. And regulation may even contain combinations. Then, of course, we have the stakeholders on the other side. They also have their expectations. They want to influence because they have interests, they have views, they have normative ideas about how things should work and what should be and not be. They want to, so to say, uh, claim their democratic rights and represent or participate directly. And maybe they even want to do it for personal development. And there is always the shadow side that uh, manipulating the process for personal reasons, keeping back information, and we have to be aware of that. Uh, but at the same time, I'm now more working or thinking about the light side of the participation and, and want to proceed on that and also show an example where uh, the light side has been a bit more dominating uh, and where top down has met bottom up. And here I would just like to introduce one more figure that we have been uh, using in the same handbook. And this is a stairway of intensity of participation and interaction. And it's about power sharing. The more you, so to say, uh, interact, the more intensively you can also have power and participate in the in the what in the outcomes and affect the outcomes. At the same time, all these steps are needed and uh, depends on again on the participants, the process phase, and the purpose. Uh, because the problem solving is especially interesting, uh, and if you want to really get to the depth to things, uh, we want to focus here a little bit on the collaboration and the conditions for collaboration. And if you want to have a collaborative approach, if you want to have co-management, or if you want to somehow have a, a process that you really create together, you need to think about trust and recognition, you need to think about open communication, you need to have a common language shared knowledge that is accepted by everyone 
And you need to be aware of dependencies and conflicts between stakeholders. And uh, you need to have a common understanding of both of the problems and of the solutions. And all of this is, of course, and that's what Ramonas has already, so to say, lifted is framed by the institutional framework. And this differs very much between different uh, countries, and it can also differ between the institutional levels. And an important uh, focus is to keep the conflict escalation low, because otherwise you will not have any kind of dialogue. And then, of course, you also need to talk with each other and you need to understand each other. And this could probably look like uh, in, a, in a more modern day dialogue. So if we're now zooming in on Koster and Waller and marine conservation with this broader perspective and the shared open ecosystem of Skagerrak and uh, marine and coastal natural values, the people and a rural area partially threatened by depopulation and many traits with intensifying tourism and other types of environmental uh, issues and we have like use and protection needs and we have a want to have a living archipelago so we have this kind of issues where we need to think about competition coexistence and synergies between different uses and i'm sure Ida will come back to this as well so how does it look like if we now dive down into the west coast and look into the Waller Costa weather trench uh, here is uh, the border of the national parks of both Utrevaler and Koster. And as you can see, this is the Koster Islands, uh, the ones that are a little bit here in the, now I have to get the cursor to the right place. Here, these are the Koster Islands. And as you can see, this uh, map looks a little bit like a Swiss cheese. And the interesting thing here is that uh, this Swiss cheese is actually due to uh, uh, the compromise that has been reached in the national park process, because comparing um, Norway and Sweden, there is an important difference in uh, the design of national parks, that in Norway, uh, private land, land ownership is allowed in national parks, whereas in Swedish national park, the land has to be owned by the state. So there was actually, when they wanted to establish a national park, a marine national park, there was the issue of expropriation, yes or no. And uh, because there is a, pos a need that you want to keep, the Strömstad municipality wanted to keep a living archipelago and inhabited island with, uh, there's about uh, 300 uh, year round inhabitants. And in summer time, it might be between, <laughs> well, 5,000 or some, sometimes more. So there's a huge uh, increase in population on the coastal islands, but also in the different, uh, in the archipelago on the islands. And this kind of fluctuation, both of leisure house owners, but uh, also of, of uh, visitors plays a role. And if you want to have people coming and if you want to have, uh, so to say, visitors feeling that this is really nice here, you also need to have the people living there because otherwise it will be dead. And this is always a, a threat in these areas that you have like a uh, those who are coming in summer, taking over, taking over the infrastructure, the water uh, resources uh, are, are, are scarce and uh, you have a lot of wear and tear in the, in the islands. And in that sense, the a national park was eventually seen as a possibility to actually limit or steer that kind of impact. And that has been one of the important uh, keystones from the land side, while on the seaside there has been the uh, a compromise between fisheries and conservation that has, so to say, helped uh, the national park to establish. And that all the at the same time, the, the authorities from national level who have led the process have been listening and have also been involving uh, local residents and local organizations. So what do we have here? I will just show a few pictures. We have Lima mussels, we have, we have corals here. Did you know that we have cold water corals? So it's not that they are far down, so you cannot dive there, but um, they are there. And uh, they are uh, also threatened through, uh, not the least through trawling. We have kelp forests and we have shrimp, and that's where the trawling comes in. I'm very indebted to Thomas Lundell for the nice underwater pictures. The upper uh, water pictures are from myself. And this is one of the classical fishing boats uh, in Koster in Ekenes. And, uh, but we also have new uses, uh, less traditional like aquaculture that is coming now very much and, and uh, questions for wind power in, in the similar areas. And of course the recreation part. 
but we also have threats uh, through uh, pollution and um, in trophication and uh, littering, which is a big problem. On the land side, we have uh, highly high um, ecological values due to, to lime in, and, and mussel beds. And we have a, a cultural landscape that is based on the fisheries, but also based on agriculture, uh, not the least uh, sheep and, and cattle to a certain extent, and keeping the landscape open. And then we have the ge geological part as well. In terms of local so societal assets, we have uh, uh, the links, transport is extremely important. The landscape or the, the maritime and, and uh, rural uh, use tradition that is now somehow transforming also into a tourism industry. We have the people, we have the marine research lab in the area, which has been really important. And we have the links between the islands and between the mainland also in both in terms of people and uh, transport, but also in terms of information. We have local organizations that are actually doing things like uh, keeping, keeping the, maintaining the landscape, but we also have the local stores and the local school. And if they are vanishing, then it is really bad. So this threat is always there for the people in the coastal archipelago. So what happened with these national park proposals that came in, actually, I, I, there, is a, there is a mistake here. It's actually 1989 and not, in, not 1998. So it's actually, it's almost uh, 30 years, more than 30 years ago that uh, this proposal came with uh, both coastal sea and other areas on the East Coast. And the first reaction from the local people was just, no, we don't want to have any national parks and we don't want to sell our land. We just have gotten back the land from the state uh, and now we, we don't, we're not going to sell it again. We want to live here. So how could it be that actually this national park eventually got inaugurated and that we have like this Norwegian-Swedish collaboration uh, that has developed over the years? And uh, we have local maintenance and local jobs. We have uh, summer visitors and we have a visitor center and uh, different types of uh, visiting infrastructure that actually works. There is one thing that is also important that if you cannot have uh, like this Swiss cheese, uh, the Swiss cheese is actually closed by a complement of um, nature reserves and different types of protected areas. So it's multiple protected area design that is held together through the uh, maintenance plan, which is called Fötzelplan to Kosterhavets National Park. And this maintenance plan was actually uh, developed in a participatory process, uh, also together with the regulations where they have been using the open standards for the practice of conservation approach. This may be something that you are also interested in looking into those of you who want to develop uh, marine protection in, in a participatory way. And this has been uh, successfully applied in other areas of Sweden and also in, uh, in the Valar area when they developed their targets. So they tried to use similar systems in order to have also a match of targets. But how did we get there? Uh, there are four thematic threats and the integration across these threats has been important. It's conservation policy, it's rural development, uh, policy and spatial planning, its cultural heritage and its fisheries management. And here we really come into the practice of integrated coastal zone management, where at times it was more the spatial planning and in the end it was actually the national park planning that to some extent uh, tried to put uh, bring the things together. So in the 60s, the Shana Marine Research Station was established and lots of research done, which established also that there's a lot of values underneath the sea and that they need to be protected. Uh, but the first focus of national protection was actually on the landscape up uh, on shore and uh, national planning and both cultural heritage and, um, and landscape and uh, natural values needed to be protected through a more a top down national process that went uh, through the local authorities, but not very much down to the local level. So when they eventually wanted to establish nature reserves, uh, there was a lot of protest and uh, this first national park plan was not really acceptable, but um, the Swedish uh, Environmental Protection Agency actually reacted in a, in a more listening way and said, okay, we're not gonna do a national park unless the local locals and the municipality want to have it. So they waited. 
And as a result also of these local protests, the locals got organized and started working with their rural development issues with study circles and local spatial planning. Uh, they founded a local heritage organization and uh, developed pride also about their, their uh, knowledge about their own background and their own roots. And a lot of EU money has actually gone into these projects. So there has been external financing and from the national and regional authorities as well. In the 1990s, the fisheries conflicts uh, escalated between researchers wanting and uh, nature protection organizations wanting to put the, set up a marine protected area because the cold water corals were identified. I will come back to that. Uh, that was eventually solved through a bilateral agreement between fisheries and conservation in 2000. Uh, at the same time, there was a local development process where this kind of idea of, okay, um, we have we need to get some kind of integrate the local opinion and there was uh, this cost board elected uh, because the municipality wanted to have some kind of a partner to interact with instead of people calling the authorities uh, when they disagree and at the same time there was also uh, this cost board eventually started working with a local sustainable development plan uh, uh, emphasizing qualitative tourism in collaboration with conservation and also uh, when the county administrative board wanted to revise the nature reserves that were eventually established, uh, they said, okay, let's work the, together with this in groups. In parallel, or so, uh, there was the next uh, step of fisheries co-management initiative where uh, the National Board of Fisheries was testing in different parts of Sweden, among other here, how fisheries could be somehow a little bit moved down uh, a level that the fishermen also could say something about fisheries. And then in the end, the national park planning uh, connected all these four thematic strands uh, and uh, partially not always without conflicts, but uh, with a visitor center, landscape restoration, reference group, municipal spatial planning and uh, local working groups uh, to develop rules and management plans. And solving the fisheries conflict uh, was actually a very big milestone in this uh, in this work, and uh, a later step for towards uh, this um, co-management in the national park and the fisheries co-management is now also represented in the national park management. And here you can see the the grid, and you can also see the collaboration uh, the course where I was actually participating, where the fishers taught us how they fish and uh, I was bringing my students to, to, uh, to the fishers and ask them to tell us how, how do you work and what are you doing and here we are discussing the future of uh, fisheries in, in northern Buisland. Um, this was actually also established based on underwater uh, coverage of knowledge we needed to know, uh, we need to know in order to do something. And based on that, these uh, six no-go zones were established. That was uh, in, uh, in relation to the Costa Weather Agreement. And uh, the co-management initiative eventually continued and uh, continued working with uh, both these cross courses and with a vision and economic development and ecological labeling. And this is now represented in the Costa National Park. Now I'm a bit in uh, trouble because I cannot see exactly how much time I have and I cannot jump my, my presentation because I'm in a different mode. <laughs> so I just want to show, Michael, how many minutes do I have? Well, uh, I think you can spend a little bit more than uh, you expect. So I think you still have like five minutes. Approximately. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I will probably jump uh, jump to the end uh, uh, very quickly in some areas, and then I will. I have a, a really nice institutional comparison between Koster and and Waller, but maybe this goes a bit too far. But uh, just just to show here that you can see these blue areas. This is where trolling is actually allowed. This has been uh, put down uh, further down in uh, in a second evaluation or re re revision of the MPA. And um, there are like areas where trolling is allowed and there are areas where trolling is not allowed. And uh, uh, there are areas, these are the red areas and the, the dark blue are areas are the ones that where trolling has was allowed. And then there is also uh, an outer trolling area. Uh, let's see whether I can get the arrow to the right. There, there is the cursor here outside of the Coastal Sea National Park. This is also why this delimitation is 
So strange disease for crayfish uh, trolling. And here also the special regulation with the smaller gear uh, applies. So this national park is actually uh, has had the goal has the goal to be sustainably used with room for both resource users, visitors, researchers, and students. And in comparison to the Waller National Park, the resource use and especially aquaculture and, and uh, but also fisheries uh, are more emphasized than on the on the Waller side. And if we are looking into the actor map that we made looking into how active these people were, are. Uh, you can see on the, on the top is Norway. Here are the Swedish national level, regional level, and the local municipalities and the local level. And here we have Strömstad, and here we have Tarnum. And these are the fishers. And here are we, the knowledge sector and the NGOs and uh, the museums. And I'm now just going stepwise from the 1989, when the National Park Plan came where the dark green means very much involved and the lighter green means less involved and the yellow means dissatisfied. So we have the fishers dissatisfied and the local resident organizations. Uh, we have the uh, nature protection uh, agency and the uh, actors and the municipalities uh, involved and more positive. When we go to the fisheries process with the fisheries agreement and then uh, the co-management Nord of uh, you can see that it's both science involved, it's the county administrative board involved, it's the National Board of Fisheries, now it's the uh, um, um, authority for marine water management, and it's also the fishers and the municipalities and not the least politicians. And here you can see WWF, WWF and the Swedish Fishers Association were involved as well and Norwegian fishers. The last part of the planning process was much more intensive and much more inclusive. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the map where you can see. And those who are yellow, these are uh, the actors that came in very late or that felt that they were not really sufficiently included, like the West Coast Conservation Fund, afraid, afraid of losing uh, 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 nature reserves, and some of the kayakers and the natural history regional actors that were a bit more uh, at the outskirts. So what this process shows is actually that um, this, uh, there has been a stairway up and down. There have been local projects where the national and the regional authorities and the municipalities were involved by local actors and the other way around where the national authorities involved the locals. And this is an important thing. And uh, in that sense, this is, uh, it, uh, it is really important to, so to say, come to uh, a meeting between these different parts. And I would like, I think I'm going <laughs> to just show you a few things here that if we look uh, at Koster and Waller, then you see the sustainable resource use has been important uh, for, for Koster and the Waller, it is not as much, but fisheries is allowed. And in terms of the management system, uh, there is a specific model for Koster and is now tested for broader relevance, whereas in Norway, they have a general model working and uh, it is more uh, generalized for both uh, marine and for onshore national parks. And also the decision-making bodies are more mixed on the local level. It's the locals that are involved in the Koster, uh, Koster uh, Sea delegation while on the Norwegian side, it's the municipal and uh, regional politicians. At the same time, the users are consulted. But this board has more, uh, so to say, more authority. They can actually take authority decisions where, while the Coster uh, board is, the Coster C delegation is not allowed doing this. So these are the people uh, that they are in the, that are in the Coster C delegation in the co-management board from, for the first time. And I'm now jumping towards the end. I'm sorry that I have to do it that way. I would have rather liked to share my screen. So to come to my conclusions, uh, participation and collaboration from no way to let's try and sustainable use. There have been two increasingly parallel participatory national park processes. Norway started much later. Um, the authorities from all levels have been involved, multi-level governance, municipalities, Many stakeholders, many interests, many topics, a long process, lots of resources, key individuals uh, among the different fractions that have helped the process to come together, 
key sectors, fisheries, tourism, small scale farmers and residents that have been involved act actively, politicians that have engaged themselves for their living countryside, and many instruments that are used both conservation and planning and sector management. And there have been lots of regional and local pro projects and uh, different, so to say, designs for Norway and Sweden, but they work and they work together. So now I would like to, sorry, there. And glimpses from the East Coast. Here we have uh, from the Sankt Anna Archipelago. And what, this, what can be said is that uh, if there is a good process that is uh, well anchored and there is trust and there is sufficient interest from both the ones for the national park and the ones against the national park to find underlying values, common ideas, and there is some kind of a common uh, point of departure, then you can find an agreement. But in the um, uh, Nemde archipelago, there is now a process on the way, while Sankt Anna, the people are very satisfied with ACTA Sankt Anna and their uh, uh, Helcom uh, Baltic Sea Protected Area Management. So that's, um, <laughs> that's so to say, the short <laughs> of, of the whole thing. So now I just want to say, uh, yes, balance, ecology and economy and social dimensions. Uh, it's difficult just to have uh, marine conservation tools. If you want to have constructive conflict management, it is important to work with trust and meaningful expectation and uh, me sorry, meaningful participation and manage the expectations, have time and resources ready and think long term. You need to think about institutional integration and you need to think about adaptive management and evaluation of le and learning. So I think I want to say thank you now and uh, wait for questions. <laughs>